bro. Печатает, ну я печатаю слово фаблаб, потому что это наша лаборатория. И поверхности тем дольше. Если это какой-то человек будет небольшой, он будет быстрее печатать. Получается, это на основе сухого копылевого молока, а тут на основе микрофона. Вот есть видео, вот есть тест. Тесты. Система. Совершенствуется законодательная база. 
Так, в прошлом году в рамках программ академической мобильности 2000 диаспоры и иностранных студентов. В результате по проекту Всемирного банка создание современного плана умной экономики. Поэтому уже в 60 лет предстоит рейс, который позволит вузам стать передовыми центрами. Where in the, in the uh, education systems, but also helping in respect to the education system, concern in human affairs. Um, in fact, I'm convinced of the future, and uh, I know we have some psychologists in the room. And radio was was really going going fast. Internet radio. Who we'll know that that prediction was just? It was uh, President Jiang uh, Zemin of China. Um, good luck getting it under control. <laughs> Those choices have consequences. So I'm not a big believer in that the future is uncertain, and it is volatile. We have to make plans, uh, and we have to try and anticipate to be inadequate. Um, talk a little bit about how it get actually mapped quite nicely how offered. So when, one way to think about student Алло, алло, алло. Алло, здрасте. Take away from here. 
Um, so I will hand it over to Dr. O'Donnell, uh, who will provide us with some overview of context. And thank you everybody for coming here this afternoon. If I'm speaking too quickly, um, please let me know and I will try and slow down. Okay, one of the big themes that we are exploring here today is simply the concept of gender equality. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals. Can I just have a show of hands? Who's seen this slide before? Probably seen it 100,000 times. It was developed primarily in Paris in 2015, and it's a set of goals developed and agreed to at the United Nations on ways to make society fairer, more equal, uh, more productive, more prosperous, and Really, one of the issues that we're exploring here this afternoon is one of the aspects of equality, and that is gender equality. This is one of the many representations you'll see on how gender equality works around the world. Um, we've got some colleagues here from the United States. I think we've got Peter and Chip in the front row. Oh, sorry, Peter's from Edinburgh. Uh, Chip is from Buffalo. We've got other colleagues from different parts of the world. And I, I think they would agree that no one has a perfect understanding of gender equality. Some of us might look to the United States and say the legislation is strong, uh, the social empowerment is strong, but I think even Chip would say it's not perfect in practice. Um, I think, Peter, you would say in, in, in Edinburgh, in the UK, it's, it's not bad, but could be better. Is that right? Is that fair? And Peter was saying today he's worked in Hong Kong, and I'm sure you would say there, there's, there's more work to do, as there is here at Nazarbayev University, as there is here in Kazakhstan, as there is in my home country of Australia. In some ways, not bad but more work to do. So what is this thing called gender equality? What does it look like? What does it mean? We're not going to answer that very specifically today, but what we hope to do is raise some questions. And the work that Jennifer and Anna have done here on this campus has been very productive in challenging us to test our assumptions. And I think this is one of the benefits of a conference like this. What do we assume is gender equality in higher education? What does it look like? Do we need to change anything? Are we satisfied with the status quo or not? I can tell you, I'm not satisfied with what we're doing here. And the work that Jennifer and Anna have done is proof that there is more work to do. Okay, the global context is important for us. As I think we all know, um, typically women tend to earn less than men throughout their lives. They retire with less money. They typically take on more domestic and unpaid labour. All of this is changing in many parts of the world, including here in Kazakhstan. But for many people in this room today, this is not just interesting theory, this is life. This is life lived every day. Um, the Dean of our School of Education, Aida Sakantara, gave a beautiful speech on Saturday at graduation. And she put it in a nutshell by saying, imagine you are a highly qualified professional person. You've been invited to go abroad to give a keynote speech at a major conference. You say yes, you are well prepared. The day you are due to leave, your child is sick. What do you do? And that's, that's, the dilemma that many people 
face, not just mothers, but fathers, people who are caregivers. All of these dilemmas are everyday decisions. I did ask Raina what she did. She said she went to the conference and she asked her husband to look after their sick daughter, which of course he did. And that's really the reality. We know it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to really shape a university, which is why it's great we have critical friends amongst us here today that will give us advice on how to better shape this university for the future. Okay, so if we look at the, um, at the McKinsey data on the value of women in the workforce, what that data tells us is that if we can be creative and find a way to tap the power of women in the workforce, we are much more likely to build prosperous societies. The World Bank have known this for many years. They know when they work in Africa and they educate women, women can work, they tend to have fewer children, they tend to create more prosperous and more educated societies. So some of this we know intuitively, but here on the ground, here in higher education, what does that really mean? Well, we know that graduates of our universities, not just here in Kazakhstan, but around the world, are increasingly female. We also know that they don't typically make the top jobs. This graph illustrates a very, very slow progress of women into the so-called C-suite, the executive suite the CEO or the CIO or the CFO of organisations. Very, very few of those people are women. It's around 20%, even when we know about half of the graduates from universities are women. So why do we... Oh, can you still hear me? Yes. Why do we have this leaky pipeline? What's going on and what can we do about it here in the university sector? Well, can I just give you a couple of examples of what we are doing here at this university? And Jennifer and Anna will tell us what we're not doing. And we're not doing a lot of things and we need to do them. So in a sense, this is a call for action for us. It's a reality check for us. And it's a way to share with all of you um, that we are far from perfect, but we are conscious of our own faults and failures, and we are determined to be better in the future. But let me just tell you what we are doing. Um, because we've got great faculty here, they tell us what to include in all of the key university policies. Some years ago, we wrote a policy on the strategy for learning and teaching in this university. Because of some of the colleagues in the Graduate School of Education, they insisted that we include one of, one of our three policies, not only innovation, not only integration of learning and teaching, but inclusion. Inclusion is a key value of this university. It's solid, it's written into our policies, and we try very hard to uphold it in all that we do. So inclusion means in the classroom, we don't discriminate against gender, race, religion, place of birth, language group, sexuality, gender identity. Those things don't matter. We just want you to come to our classroom ready to learn. So inclusion is an important value. However, we are not great in other areas. We know that typically many of the senior faculty positions are not held by women. I'll speak to some more data in just a moment. Interestingly, our student base is almost perfectly half men, half women. So unlike many other universities, we have a large number 
of women students studying engineering, studying mathematics, studying physics, studying robotics. So we are well placed to be socially transformational. What we're not doing so well is making sure we have a large number of women in senior faculty roles. So this is um, information fresh from our colleagues in HR, and that says, unsurprisingly, that most of the professorial roles are held by men, not women, and that the majority of women are employed in either teaching fellow roles or in assistant professor roles. This is not unusual, unfortunately. It's quite a typical pattern, but it's a pattern that can be changed. And the work that Jennifer and Anna have done is a way to help us move from um, accepting the status quo to challenging the status quo. And the way to do that is to try and understand our own bias. Many of us have conscious bias. I might be biased against Australians, or I might be biased against football players, or I might be biased against people with freckles. Um, and that's a conscious bias. I'm not really biased against those people, but I could be. But what's really hard is the unconscious bias. It's a little bit like Donald Rumsfeld, you know, we have unknown unknowns. It's when we don't even know that we have a bias. It's unconscious. We don't, for instance, assume that if we imagine a dentist, that dentist could just as easily be female. Or if we imagine an astronaut, that astronaut could just as easily be female. If we imagine a president or a prime minister, or a chemical engineer, or a mining engineer. All of those people could just as easily be female as male. And if we exercise our unconscious bias, we might not think that. We might assume that the mining engineer is male. But in reality, the mining engineer, particularly at this university, is just as likely to be female. So we need to really challenge our own assumptions about what is possible and what is real. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to give the floor to Jennifer, who's going to talk us through a particular project that she and Anna have been working on, which is a way for us to test unconscious bias. Over to you, Jennifer. here because um, when I received this data, um, again, this is June 2019 data, so this is, is current data here, I, I knew the numbers, I knew that as an associate professor I was in the minority, but it re really hit me that I am one of only 15 female associate professors on our campus out of 85 associate professors. We have work to do. We have work to do. Um, so again, from someone who is very aware of gender issues, it was still shocking to me, the, the numbers. And so sometimes it is just helpful for us to go and find this data. Um, and this is one of the things that I want to help us understand is the difference here between gender equality and gender equity. This is a debated topic and one that for us is really important because it helps to understand why we propose some of the things that we propose and why we encourage um, our, higher, our, our leadership to uh, think differently um, about gender issues. So many of us are familiar with equality as a social issue. Um, equality says men, women, in this case, are Binary, uh, a binary way of thinking about gender, that men and women should have equal access to resources and opportunities. Some examples here would be equal access to economic participation, equal access to decision making. And many countries will say we have equality because our laws 
um, are set up this way. Many institutions will say, we have equality because our policies allow for equal access. Um, and so you can see this, this picture here shows what equality looks like. Everyone has the same platform to stand on. But you can see that with that same platform, there's still something missing. It's still not providing equal opportunity, equal access. So that's where equity comes in. Um, equity, we believe, is a quantifiable, or can be a quantifiable, data-driven measure rather than a social issue. Um, equity can help us set the stage for equality by bringing everyone to what truly is a level playing field, even though it might look like some people are getting more than other people. So you can see in the second half of the picture here, um, where we really, we really see this is equality. Everyone now sees from the same level, sees from the same point of view, but some people may need extra help to get there, to get to that place where they now can see from the same point of view. Um, so equity is what we're really striving for, and from, from a higher education perspective, equity can be data-driven. We love data in a higher education setting, right? It should be what helps us make all of our decisions. Um, equity can be quantifiable as well, and so what we have tried to do with our project that Anna will talk about is we've tried to identify some ways that we can make this more quantifiable some ways that we can identify where, as an institution, we can do better, um, where we can do things differently to help provide um, more of this, of this measure of, of equity. One way to do this is through gender mainstreaming. And we rely heavily on what the UN and the UNDP um, do in, in our projects. We worked with the UNDP um, to develop this project that we're going to speak with you about. Um, and gender mainstreaming is one of the tools that they um, have, have developed to try to bring this more to the forefront um, of, our, of our minds. So the goal of gender mainstreaming is to move gender from an add-on, something that we um, put in at the end um, or uh, later, um, and move it into the mainstream, into the everyday activities of, of our organizations. It's based on principles such as gender equality, incorporating gender into our policies, including women in decision-making, prioritizing gender equality, and also shifts in institutional culture. So really it's saying, instead of developing a new program, and then afterwards recognizing, well, maybe we have some gender issues, it's saying, well, if we are going to mainstream gender, then as we are developing this new program, we need to be considering gender issues. Um, within it. So as we're developing, for example, an evening uh, program in the School of Business, well, how does that evening program benefit or uh, benefit men or women or, or not, or, or take away from, make it difficult for men or women to engage in this program because of the nature of it? So that's where mainstreaming would, that, that's where you mainstream. You do it at, at the outset as you're going through the process instead of establishing a new evening program and then wondering, why don't we have more women in this program? What's, what's going on? We, now let's think about this after we have an enrollment that is perhaps 90% men. Um, and there's many reasons why that, that might happen. So that's what we're trying to, to do, is we're trying to take some steps to mainstream gender into our practices um, in higher education. Is this working? Um, and so one of the ways that we have done this is to take one tool of mainstreaming, which is a gender audit, and for us to say here at the university, a gender audit is a first step. It's, it's one step in our process. And to, to take an opportunity that we were given to try to mainstream um, gender through a gender audit. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Anna to uh, tell you more about our audit and the specific project that we, that we engaged in. Okay, thank you all. So, all right, so when we think about gender audit, so as Jennifer mentioned, so a first step, 
the gender audit then is a tool, and this is something that has been used worldwide as a step towards gender mainstreaming. I think about it as assessing what you have in, in your pantry, right? Before you can know what you need to go and buy, before you can know how you may want to change something in your process, in this case, in buying something, or in your policies, you need to know what you have there first. So what we then did, so this gender audit, as Jennifer had mentioned, we worked with the UNDP, they came to us, they asked us and they said, can you do a study that then could be an example for other institutions of higher education, other organizations within Kazakhstan, and potentially the region also? And so we had a limited time frame, and we looked to see, well, what could we look at? So within a gender audit, there's many different indicators that you could assess. You can go through a full gender audit would include focus groups with faculty, with staff, with students to understand the experiences. You would also have observations. You would collect all different types of documents. For us, as a first step, we decided to look at formal curriculum. So in this case, syllabi is one example of formal curriculum. So to stay, take a step back for a minute also, we can think again about gender and universities. And so we can recognize, and we came into this with the recognition that universities are gendered institutions, just as, oh, Just as any institution is, right? We have, we're looking at gender again as a binary in this case, so that has its own limitations. But in this scenario, right, we're looking at the institution itself. There's issues of hiring, wages, promotion. Loretta has mentioned this as well. Universities worldwide are looking to affect gender equality and steps towards making these changes. So then, then the purpose, right, of this NU audit was the gender audit itself, analyze and report on the formal curriculum, what is being used across the disciplines. So this is something new that we weren't sure about. We wanted to discover if there was a gendered nature of the syllabi themselves, right? What is contained within? We know the university itself is gendered, but what does it actually mean within the formal curriculum? This has been a step to inform policy and to provide the sample guidelines for others. So we went into this then with the broad research question, in what ways are the formal curriculum across NU gender? In that, so what are the similarities and differences across the disciplines? What can we understand from this basically? What are the issues that could be identified and how could they be resolved, whether quickly or in a longer term manner. So we went through a process then, what is referred to within gender mainstreaming and gender audits as a desk review, document analysis, again, of formal curriculum. So the formal curriculum, I will show you in a moment, came from multiple different disciplines and we had multiple different ways of collecting the syllabi. We went through and determined our content analysis. What were we looking at within these syllabi, right? So this included course level, the content, everything that was described, the descriptions, the themes, any assignments. If there, we, we then went to identify the gender of the faculty, of the authors that were written within the articles or any other textbooks. This could take multiple steps at times, right? Where, you know, for instance, the APA format, you don't include the person's first name and you may not know then what the gender is, so you continue to do the research or a name could have different, could be from different genders. The inclusion of a non-discriminatory statement, we also look to see, okay, what does this imply, whether or not we have one or we do have one, and then the, any gender classification of teaching assistants that might be available. So as we went through the syllabi, ways in which you know, 
to conduct this analysis then into keyword searches with mini syllabi, as I will list also, the line by line analysis, calculating the number of readings, how many readings, how many of them are authored by women, by men. And so, little by little, then we went through the syllabi to analyze it. So then in our next step, we're within the syllabi, so this just gives you a bit of a sense of where we collected the data from. And so we were able to, this, the first one is the Nazareth University's first year program. The director was able to provide us the list of the syllabi. In this case, there's two primary syllabi that then act as a, as a template for all of the courses that are taught from the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. We were able to get those publicly available online from the Graduate School of Education. There was a request made to the Dean and some of those were also publicly available. Over this time, just as kind of a side note, these practices have now changed in part because of our presenting on this information. That now we're making changes to make all syllabi available for everyone. And then from the Graduate School of Business, there's a school-wide database for the syllabi. So when we looked across the courses, so there were a total of 131 courses. The instructor balance within the courses taught, you can kind of see broadly, right? So in red, you have the women faculty and you have men faculty. So 40 female, 90 or 40 women, 90 men. None of the courses at NU within this time frame, so we were looking between the years 2015 to 2017, none of them had a specific topic relating to gender, right? So women in politics or gender in education, gender in business. And then, so overall then, right, the imbalance you can see within the gender in the courses, within the instructors. So this suggests without this information, you wouldn't know what steps you could potentially make. Okay, so starting then to highlight other aspects, the reading, the authorship, the topic. So the total readings, we had 2,680 readings that were identified across all of the disciplines, all of the courses, and only about 20% of them were authored by women. This if you compare it across the world, it's at other institutions, it's actually a pretty good number to have 20%. But what that says is that across the institutions and including within ours, we really have steps to take to show that knowledge is created both by men and also by women. So the topics then also, the vast majority here so 99.3% of the topics did not address anything to do with gender. So again, overall, you can see an imbalance of readings and topic adding on to the instructors as well. So as we move on then, teaching assistance, non-discriminatory statement. This, this we see only some of the syllabi identified having a teaching assistant and having the name of the teaching assistant. The teaching assistants are in the majority women in this case, so we have a flip in terms of, again, still an imbalance, but you can at least see who is identified in this case. And then the non-discriminatory statement, there are only three courses that were taught during this time period, so from 131 courses, three that include a non-discriminatory statement, and all from the same faculty member. So, in this case, what does, what does this mean? What can we take from this? What are some short-term steps that we can do to facilitate gender mainstreaming? Because it's, it's clear that, that we have an imbalance. Something needs to be done. So on a very simple basis, we can incorporate gender topics. And so even if you have a broad force, you know, leadership, leadership in business and education, whichever topic, 
there's then within there, you could have a day, a reading, something that addresses the fact that women exist in this discipline, within the world, within the leadership in this context. You can locate and assign sets of readings, cases, assignments related to these gender themes. In some cases, this is a challenge to know, right? So we have also been taught using particular texts, right? Historical texts that are primarily, that are male heavy, at least historically. And so it does take some work, but this is where the case of, at least at NU, and if you're connected with the Consortium of Gender Scholars, you can come to us, you can come to GenCon to look for additional help in locating these resources. There are other organizations that also do this, including for finding speakers. I know there are some great business programs and organizations that have long lists of keynote speakers that are women. Because often, again, those first names that come to mind tend to be men. Okay. A little bit of feedback. So you can also use, there's, this is a similar one, right? Using readings written by female authors and then encourage or even require in this case a non-discriminatory statement on all four syllabi. And so part of that is to understand within the faculty itself, what does this mean? What does it mean when I put a non-discriminatory statement? Will, how will I affect or enact that within the classroom? And so that's something that actually came up in the teaching and learning meeting, that if we have you know, a university-wide non-discriminatory statement also, how is that enacted similarly or differently across, across the board? And so from, from there, then I can give one other kind of in-depth which I mentioned a little bit. So if, you, if you're not sure in your course, right, some people might say, well, gender doesn't really relate, right? Well, how, how am I going to involve this discussion? So an example, so in, in a sociology, right, an introduction to sociology, you could assign readings or discussions by studying how women and men are affected differently by sociocultural forces. And of course, on political violence, gender can be included to address political violence, the way that it touches men and women. So this is, this is a construct that touches us, us all. So even when we see that the imbalance is, in this case, right, primarily affecting the absence of female knowledge or women's knowledge, it's, it's something that by having that lack of evidence or knowledge, it is affecting everyone Right? Everyone who is taking in the information and learning from it. Okay, and so from there, I will pass it back off to Jennifer. So before I move on, I think I'll further expand on this on this um, idea here because um, there are many people who say, "Well, you know, how can I incorporate gender in my course? My course doesn't lend itself." to a topic related to gender. And one of the things that we've done here at the Zoraida University is we have had a week of women for the past five years, I believe now. Um, and the week of women, we typically have it during the, um, the week of that where International Women's Day falls. Um, and one of the things that we've done is we've encouraged faculty during that week to think about how can you incorporate topics within your course. Perhaps it's not necessarily a topic specifically related to gender. So for in this case, um, they pull up differences in the way political violence affect men and women. But perhaps if you are an economics professor, maybe you highlight um, a, a reading by a female author. It's as simple as that. It does not have to necessarily mean a topic that's gender related. There might not be gender topics um, in your engineering program, um, although more and more we see research on the way that men and women think differently lead to, way, to the way that they engineer things differently. There's all kinds of things that you could discuss, but maybe it doesn't fit within your course at that time, but there are ways that you can incorporate gender so that um, we're becoming more aware of it. So with the Week of Women, we try to encourage professors to do that. Um, we try to encourage them to think about how can I bring this topic to a course that otherwise I might not bring it into. 
um, and give them an opportunity or a reason to do it that doesn't seem out of the ordinary, because it's during the Week of Women. And so during the Week of Women, we all will discuss this. Instead of feeling like, oh, I'm just trying to add it on and make it, make it something um, you know, extra, and, and it feels strange to, to include it in there. So this is also one thing that we've done here at the university. And this is one of, it, it can be incorporated into our long-term recommendations that we developed um, for Brown's Rhode University. And these are long-term recommendations. These are things that here at the university we're still working on, or maybe we haven't even started to work on. Um, but these are things that we believe can help our university and help other institutions of higher education uh, to bring gender into the mainstream, to, to move it from an add-on to a central part of what we consider in our considerations. The first thing that we suggest for us at the university is to create a non-discriminatory statement for the university. Surprisingly, as we did this research, we realized that we don't have one. Again, we were surprised by this. We thought, surely we have a non-discriminatory statement somewhere. So that led us to looking in some of our other documentation, well, documents. Well, in our faculty policies and procedures, there's something that addresses issues of discrimination. In our student code of conduct, there's something that, that also addresses um, issues related to discrimination, but we do not have a statement as a university that says we are opposed to various forms of discrimination in the classroom, in the hiring process, in the promotion process, so on and so forth. So this was one of our first uh, recommendations. We took this to the University Teaching and Learning Committee. I am a member of the Teaching and Learning Committee, and Loretta is the chair of the Teaching and Learning Committee. And the Teaching and Learning Committee said, well, of course we should have this statement. Let's work on drafting it. And so that is one of our goals in the coming year, is to propose a non-discriminatory statement to our Teaching and Learning Committee, hopefully for um, approval and inclusion in our university document. Um, but this is also something that as individual faculty, we can also do. We can include a statement in our syllabi. Again, we were surprised that only one person had one, and it wasn't me and it wasn't Anna, and that was also surprising as well. But even in our own syllabi, we failed to put a statement in there that says we stand opposed to discrimination within our classes. We have maybe other statements in there that talk about inclusion and voice of voices within our discussions. But again, it's a simple step that we can take that can um, just set the stage for everyone to recognize that in our classrooms at our university, this is what we, what we um, stand, stand for and what we believe in. So that's one long-term recommendation. Another is to develop more courses expressly focused on gender. So as Anna mentioned, in this two-year time period that we did our analysis from 2015 to 2017, there was not a course offered that, that had gender as one of its main themes. And I said, wait, sure there, sure there is. I teach a course like this. Sure it was in there. Well, not in that time frame. I didn't teach that course. And for some reason, other courses that we know exist weren't taught in that time frame. So it just helps us to understand, well, maybe we should be offering these more regularly. Maybe this should be a regular offering that we're, we're providing. I know there's one, there's a, a course in SHSS on uh, gender and kinship. Um, there's other courses on gender and work. I taught a course in gender and communication. So they exist, uh, but maybe we need to pull them into the rotation more, more regularly or more often. Maybe as school teaching and learning committees, we need to call for this, we need to ask for this, and um, try to approve more courses with this as the express topic. So that was one of our other long-term recommendations, is to develop these courses. Um, something else, again, we, we partnered with uh, UNDP on this project, and so this came from our partnership, um, is to become a UN He for She University champion. Um, so he, the, the UN program He for She has several university champions where the president of the university dedicates to a number of, of steps um, by becoming a champion, um, a, a he for she champion. And so this is one of the things that we will hopefully soon propose to our president to become a, a UN he for she champion um, and in doing so take some of these dedicated steps. I, I recall several of them 
Um, one of them is to have uh, required training for students, for incoming students, uh, related to gender equality and discrimination. Um, another is to institute several hiring practices and promotion practices. So there's a number of these policies that, um, that could be implemented if we were to take this long-term recommendation. Um, another one related to hiring is to establish diversity goals for hiring. Um, diversity goals meaning a set of principles that lead hiring committees to consider the diversity of applicants and to value diversity in its hiring practices. As we started to talk to others, we realized that very few people on our hiring committees have had any training in the process of hiring um, and in how to ensure that you are being fair and um, that you are Non, that you're not discriminating in the hiring practice. Um, even simple things as saying, oh, well, she has two children. That right there could lead to a different view of this person than another person um, in, in the hiring process. So even some simple um, policies, um, or diversity goals, and then some training um, could, could be something to help encourage uh, diversity and encourage um, equity and equality within our university. Um, our fifth recommendation is to encourage awareness among the student body. Um, we, did, we, we looked at curriculum, we did not look at what was going on in the student body. However, we're very aware of what's going on within our university, um, and after talking with a number of people, we recognize that this is something that we also need to do at the student level, not just within the classrooms um, of our university. So encouraging awareness among the student body about gender and diversity through partnership with student clubs. We have a number of student clubs on our campus who are um, who are working with very very hard on this topic. They spend, they're spending a lot of time and energy um, to bring awareness to us. Equality Talks um, is one such um, organization. Student clubs, completely student driven, that's bringing awareness to to these issues. Um, and so, one of the things that we can do on the side of higher education leadership is to encourage that. Um, if our students feel like this is something that we are taking seriously and that we encourage, they're more likely to also then follow suit and do the same thing and feel like they can step out and discuss these issues. Um, another long-term recommendation is to require diversity training um, of all of our employees. We at Desiree University have the benefit of having some amazing partners, um, and our partners, many of them have diversity training that's required their universities and so one of our initiatives then is to reach out to a partner to bring their diversity training here we don't need to reinvent the wheel and do our own but when we have partners who are already uh, worldwide um, experts in these topics and can bring it to us um, and then the last long-term recommendation that we that we would have here for our university is to implement a mentoring program for female faculty and staff um, Loretta already gave you the numbers you can see that as the pipeline um, Goes, goes higher, that we have fewer and fewer women in those positions, um, from instructor to assistant to associate to full professor. And then if you look as well, in our, in our leadership of the university, you can see we have one female uh, dean. I don't believe we have any women who are associate deans. Um, we have one female in, in our provost's office as well. Um, we have one female vice president. This is great, this is a first step, and we can do better. Um, and so implementing a mentoring program specifically for female faculty and staff um, to, to, to help provide support for moving up and encouragement uh, for moving up, for applying for those positions um, that, are, that are higher. And so these were our recommendations here, here at our university based on our knowledge of what's going on here. And these are just a few of the things that we can recommend but when we were looking at what things do we believe that our university can do and can do relatively easily, these were the recommendations that um, Anna and I came up with as, as researchers. Um, so I'll move on then to some recommendations for higher education leaders in general. Um, and so for those of you who are at other institutions, um, what, are, what are some takeaways? What are some things that you can, can go back um, and do? Well, first things first, I would say conduct gender audit. As Anna said, you don't really know, we don't know what we need to change or what we need to do differently until we have an understanding of what it is that we're doing. And that's what an audit allows us to do. So conduct an audit. There are experts um, around the world who are available to do gender audits. And if you need uh, 
connections with any of them, and I would be happy to uh, put you in touch with the, the network. Um, and then use those results to generate ideas for change. So just like our ideas that we have here, use your results to generate ideas. What is it that, that you think at your university um, you can change? And then the third step that I suggest is to obtain support from all of your um, leaders in, within your higher education institution. Now notice, I put this as step number three, and I put it there on purpose. I do think that sometimes when you go to leaders, um, our, our leadership at our university, it's very supportive of, of all of the ideas that faculty bring to them, that staff, that, that others bring to them. Um, but without data, sometimes they have a hard time taking those steps forward. And so I suggest getting that data first. Do the audit based on that data, find and generate those ideas, then take it to them. Because they're going to say, well, how do you know? How do you know that we need to do this? Well, here's how I know. My data shows it. And very few leaders in higher education will deny data. That's, that's, what we, that's what we need, that's what science is based on, right? And so if you can take that, then they're more likely to, to uh, first of all, believe you, and then second, understand the steps that need to be, to be uh, implemented to move forward. So collect data in some, in some way. It doesn't have to be a full gender audit. Um, Anna said, we had two months to complete ours. We were approached by UNDP. They said, we have some funding. You need to use it in two months. What can you do? So we came up with something we could do uh, very quickly. We thought we would need to do more audits to be able to start moving forward for change. But in fact, with this data, our, our um, university administration is saying, great, let's, let's start. Let's see what we can do um, and move forward. So, so generate that data, generate your ideas, and then obtain support from, from your leadership. Um, you know, Loretta is here with us. She's, she's showing by her presence here the support that we have um, from the provost office for, for some of these changes. And then I would suggest establish a working group uh, to implement the change. Right? I know working group is the new name for committee. Right? Now, now instead of just having a committee, we're actually going to do something. We're, we're working. Um, but I do believe that you need buy-in from multiple groups within the university. And so by establishing that working group, you start to get more ideas, you start to generate more data um, that then can drive the change that you're looking for. So establish the working group, get many people on board with what you're trying to, trying to do. Um, so I will conclude then with this idea of um, thinking long term and making changes as you go. Yes, we should assess and we should address these short term issues. So for example, I think what we've what already told you, Things like assigning readings written by female authors, incorporating gender topics or sets of readings. Those are short-term issues. Those are short-term issues that lead us toward our long-term goals. So don't, don't um, discount the short-term uh, in the effort to reach the long-term. But continue thinking long-term. Continue thinking about um, how can we affect change that will happen in five years, in 10 years, um, and moving our university forward. So long-term issues related to uh, gender equality would be raising awareness of gender within the organization, things like implementing the hiring practices, um, like, like we've already mentioned. So our goal here at the university is now that we've started to identify some of these, to really think more long-term. What can we do then um, to, to, to create some long-term goals, and then how can we, how can we effectively get there? So we have planned on um, an hour of our, of our talk, and I believe we're there. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for, for you all to ask questions um, of us and to generate discussion um, for those of you who are from other universities to find out what you're doing, what has worked, um, what, what are things that um, didn't work, uh, and then to hopefully be able to talk together about ways that we can and move forward toward uh, these goals that we that we have. So I will stop there. Um, I have a couple of microphones here that we can we can use to uh, pass around. Yes, are they working? Mm -hmm.
comments do you have, please? Um, and tell us who you are so we know so we know who is in this talk. Um, hi, I'm Rianne. I teach in the New Zip program, which is the pre-master's English program um, here at NU. And 
I know it's not very good conference etiquette. It's not really a question. It's more of a comment, if that's all right. Um, I know that you were talking about paternity, and, and your question may have related to that, but it reminded me of one of the problems we deal with in New Zip, in that although we have a 50-50 instructor or teaching fellow gender right, there's three women and three men, it just so happens that two women teach reading and two men teach communication. So a lot of the gender stuff that we bring up is focused on the classes that the two women teach and it's not very focused in the classes that the men teach. And that's not for any intentional purpose. It's just that we, my, my co-teacher and I, Liz, we feel more of an impetus to talk about these things. So one of the steps we're taking for next academic year is we're making the syllabus we're forcing different gender teachers to teach the same lesson uh, because in the past our male students have reacted much more favorably to talks about gender when it comes from a man. We're saying the same message and the people believe, the teachers believe the same things, but I, I don't know, maybe it's a familiarity thing, maybe it's just less threatening when it comes from the same gender, but we're hoping that by including men in our own push for gender equality, or at least more men, that we can somehow change how the students themselves are looking at the issue. So that may be another way to help balance the scales if you have men in your team or at your school who are willing to take on these things to speak about them. Thank you for that comment. Um, this is what the um, campaign and has been all about. It's about ensuring that we have multiple voices um, who are talking about this, including male voices. Um, because typically when we have a topic on gender, you can look around the room and see <laughs> that the majority, overwhelmingly, um, are women who are in the room. But in order for us to move this forward, we do need male voices as well. Um, and so this is one of the, the ways to do that, is to ensure that it's not only women who are talking about these topics and who are incorporating them perhaps into their courses, but that men are also doing that. And um, from our position in the Consortium of Gender Scholars, I can say that we have a number, quite a number of our male colleagues who are enthusiastically including these topics in their courses and are um, with a lot of uh, research behind uh, them, talking about them and bringing them to light in a number of different disciplines. Um, and all that can do is help support, from our perspective, all that can do is help support the conversation to help ensure that we have many different voices um, who are participating. And so thank you for, for that comment. Sure. Yeah, I was just gonna add one more thing. So one thing that I wanted to, to point out or that was important as kind of a foundation of what we're talking about is that going back to the image of equality and equity, so you can see the different crates, right? To how do you make this level playing field? And so sometimes we can revert to this concept of how do we support people who are struggling, right? How do we support, let's say, women from not leaking through the pipeline, right? We need to give them more crates, let's say, right, in this metaphor. But it's a better way we change our terminology. So the way that we're talking about it is how do we facilitate structures so everyone can succeed, right? So there's nothing inherently inherently within the person, within the women who are not making it, let's say, to the top. Instead, it's the structural issue. So, okay, so I saw a question. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. I'm a freelance multilingual translator and interpreter, and uh, uh, I wanted to ask if you have any uh, general statistics as for uh, gender equality in Kazakhstan, because so when I moved in Chinese, uh, oil field in uh, TCO, I often came across gender inequality over there. And uh, here, even in, in, I live now in the left bank, uh, Stan, or North Sultan, sorry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like uh, people, uh, some of uh, local population comprehend me. Um, either, so, like, uh, in the best case, uh, like something, female that moves and uh, or ancient profession, you know, something like this. And not uh, at all as an expert in linguistics, which I dedicated 23 years of my life. And uh, this is uh, quite um, sometimes uh, oppressive, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask uh, what uh, um, in statistics uh, as a whole, like 
maybe in the profession of uh, translators and interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. from um, University of Edinburgh. So I have a, I have a, a comment, a suggestion, and a question. Um, <laughs> so the comment was about um, UN women. So one of your goals is to become uh, a, a, a UN Kikishi University champion. Um, I, I, I don't know whether you're already in discussion with UN women, but I was a UN uh, uh, Kikishi impact champion when I worked in Hong Kong. And when I was leaving Hong Kong to go to Edinburgh, I asked UN women whether I could continue in that role, and they said no. Um, because, they have a limited number. Because they, well, they have a limited number, and also they were very clear that it's their uh, designation. It's not something that you can apply for. 
Um, so, but what they do have is some kind of associate status. So you can you can apply for associate status. So, I mean, I would just encourage you. They're, you know, they're very reasonable, but they do want to keep the impact chapter group small. Um, and so have a dialogue with them, and, and I can connect them with them if necessary because I know them all very well. Um, so my suggestion, uh, this is one of the very few good ideas I've had in my time, um, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is when you, when you organize any event on gender equity, uh, um, always encourage everyone that comes to bring someone with them of a different gender. <laughs> because that way you increase the size of the audience, um, and also you get more men. Because I'd like you, it's always the same. You have any event on gender equity, the attendance is small and it's predominantly female. And so if you actually, so I used to, at Hong Kong U, I used to make that a stipulation and it did work. You did get bigger audiences and you did get more men. So that's just a practical suggestion. Um, my question was going to be, uh, so um, uh, my question was around the binary nature of gender. And one of the reasons that he for she is controversial, it, because it is is because it treats gender as binary. And certainly in the UK now, um, and I've been really struck by this since I've been back in the UK, uh, every time you talk about gender, you start getting into quite sensitive areas around the non-binary nature and about uh, the rights of particularly of transsexual people. Um, and so I just wanted to know, you know in, in, in this part of the world, is that already becoming an issue? Because if it's not, my prediction is it will soon. <laughs>
one illustration is that next week we are hosting the very first <laughs> conference on gender here at Nazarbayev University. Anna and Jennifer are part of the organising committee for that. And I'll be honest and say the original topic was the very first um, conference on gender and sexuality. And because we are, I, I am personally a little bit more cautious, um, I suggested and the committee very graciously agreed to make it a conference initially on gender. So that's, I'm, I, I don't think I'm very proud of that part of our conversation here, but we take things one step at a time. You know, we don't change things overnight. Um, we acknowledge the research, of course, because as Jennifer said, um, people who work in universities live and breathe data, and if there's data around fluid sexuality, we, we look at the data, we try and understand and interpret what that means. But it's, it's one step at a time, and we go thoughtfully and carefully, and, and we do our job the best we can, and then we, we will work with the community around us, and they, they give us feedback on, on how we're travelling, and how thoughtful and useful our work is, and then we, we work in dialogue with them. So I don't know if that exactly responds to your comment, but, but your comments, I, I must say, are very much appreciated. This side, just very <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, this year I have changed my work with the administrative staff in the faculty, and uh, we I've been asked to implement something new in the course, and one of the uh, they asked me to implement the uh, program of the Mission Fund of Nepal, modernization of public consciousness. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm teaching philosophy, and I thought like, how I'm going to. Modernization into the strict course of the philosophy. So I started with having some for students' individual work where I could actually do some little bit uh, academic freedom stuff. And I started to like bring the students into groups and they have to prepare their project. So the, one of the questions that students are supposed to find the, the topics in the modernization of consciousness. I did a small uh, Brainstorming, and they had to discuss what kind of topic they are interested. And it was like in one a small group was two, uh, three boys and three girls, and they started to discuss the gender issue, like who should should the rule uh, at home, men or women? I mean, if there is a like both of them students, who is supposed to stay at home and who is supposed to go and teach gender studies? And of course, the male is prevailed, and they said like, uh, well, you 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 could have a give a birth certificate to a child that you have. And it was so like <laughs> very discussion among my students. So this brought to brought me to this idea that you like brought why uh, the stereotype of the male students. So in their like vision, already it's already uh, ingrained that this is a role model. The youth is a role model to male students, and this also can be extrapolated in a choosing the uh, professions within the medical courses. For instance, you wouldn't see the ladies or females in the surgery, not because they don't want, just because this is a stereotype. Maybe they're afraid, they, they have this kind of imposing thing, they're like imposing symptoms that they have to sit at home, they have to take care of themselves, etc., etc. So this has brought me to the idea that maybe this is a stereotype of the ladies, not because, for instance, in the business we don't have ladies, not because uh, the government or the state is not didn't want to see the female in that uh, particular position. Maybe this is uh, starting from us. Yes, what, how we do see ourselves in this structure? Do I want to be a business lady? If I want, who who is supporting me in this uh, way? That way. So I think this is one of the important rules. And, and uh, I just thought that was very interesting. Not not And finally, so. I think this is maybe the region of the where I come from, Karaganda, and the uh, Nasdaq have lots of innovations in like UP for international. And uh, again, like, again, within within my marriage, again, yes. If
if I want to continue like further my research studies, etc. But the family stuff, they want them to have a children and stay at home. Whereas if I, if we will talk with your husband, like his position regarding the like going to the conference, participating, etc. He would say like, well, we don't have a children. Who's going to take us care of them? So this is again we come to the stereotypes of the uh, female. Russian and other nationalities, they are more, uh, they don't have such kind of you know, strict, that you have to model a vision of role in uh, ladies in the society, particularly in the society. So I think that would be a good like, uh, vision maybe to, to develop further how, how the, these stereotypes form and how to break those stereotypes. And that's why the Nazarbayev, in his speech, on this invitation of uh, uh, public consciousness, uh, Brought six major uh, dimensions, where one of them actually is related to this breaking down the stereotypes of the field. And this is basically it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've touched upon some really important aspects here and aspects that, you know, so Jennifer mentioned about us not being from Kazakhstan, right? So, in terms of breaking down stereotypes, this is where we need. We need local people, right? We need, so you're saying we need Kazakh families, we need Kazakh men and women to speak about, to think about, to explore, to examine the topic further, to then look towards steps to make change if this is what the culture wants, right? If this is the steps. And thinking broadly about stereotypes, so each culture, each community has their own stereotypes and they're ingrained in multiple and so uh, my previous research had been looking at ways we informally learn from media, right? So this is you know, the TV, the posters you see out. When you go to Mega, well, it's first set up, and all of the advertisements showed people that primarily looked like they were from Western countries, right? And so you're seeing then, whether it's children or it's adults, everything that's reflected back at you is then something that doesn't represent yourself. And so uh, one aspect of an audit, and I've done this within my classes before, and we're taking steps to see if we can publish it, but it's to actually look at the imagery within a campus. And so what do our pictures show? So if you go in many places on our campus, especially in this building, you, get, you see a lot of men and women. There's also large pictures, right, of tons of people. So then say, okay, it looks like there's a good balance. But then you go to some places, in a library, for instance, you walk up to the fourth floor, and there's images, I see a lot of, yes, right, shaking their heads, yes, in agreement, men, individual men, reading a book. And then the one place that you see women, it's a group of, I think it's four or five people, and the, the women are smiling, and they're laying down on the grass, and they're in a group also with men. And so what does this reflect back, right? That you know, it doesn't have to mean anything, but if you continually see that, oh, men, men are reading, men are engaged in important topics, right? And women are smiling, right? They're, they're just happy in nature. Then it could start to add to our consciousness. And so simple ways, like the example that Jennifer gave with the UNDP and imagery, right? So the imagery that we show, so the woman who is the astronaut, who's the engineer, who are in these different positions. One of the ways that I have sought to address this is by developing the Mother Scholar Project. And so with this, this is a, it's an online arts-based forum to showcase the presence of women who are mothers and academics, right? On all, all walks of life, all around the world. And what, what that shows is, at least in Western context or in the US specifically, I can give my example. I went through graduate school of education, and I had I ended up having my first child in this program, and yet I did not know throughout my years there who had children and who did not. It was so tight-lipped. And what the research shows is that, at least in the US, once you state that you have children, you, as a woman, you are diminished you are no longer assumed to be as committed to your work, as interested, as able. And so people don't talk about it, which is why then it's important to highlight it, to show that, look, we have people, we are, we are all mothers, right? So to know that we're mothers and that we can succeed in 
whether it's business and in the leadership roles in these different spaces, which then comes back to the importance of mentorship. And so this is as each of our, the Consortium of Gender Scholars, especially this last year, people continually brought up, well, do we have a mentorship program? Whether it's for undergrads or graduates or faculty, administrators, where is our mentorship so we can see what are these steps moving forward and how can we see the role models to make then the change that we want to make. Santa Medical University, I'm a teacher of medical Latin, and I've never been interested in this topic, gender policy, uh, but today you've made me uh, fancy with this topic. Thank you very much for your productive and interesting presentation. So oh, I have three questions, they are general. Uh, the first one is, uh, do, you support, uh, do you support women serving in army as troops? Second one is, are you going, are you going uh, or do you have any plans uh, to research out of the university, Nazarbayev University, because um, uh, yesterday I participated in sessions and uh, most of researchers uh, make their research on, um, in the context of Nazarbayev University. Are you going to investigate or continue this research out of, I mean in the context of universities in Kazakhstan or uh, in the context of the world because uh, condition in Japan is different because most women see to care uh, after their baby. And the third one is, um, what's your attitude to isolated universities, for example, like University of Yuhua, um, Yu, uh, Yuha in uh, South Korea, and do you support these universities? I mean, is it good to open or to educate, to open universities, such kind of universities, or to educate uh, people in isolated universities, I mean, uh, universities only for women or men. Personal experience um, with this. So, um, I grew up with a father who was in the army in the U.S. Um, he's retired now. He retired as a high-ranking official in the U.S. Army. Um, and so, from from my personal perspective and from his experience, I can say yes that I do support that. Again, that's a personal um, perspective, and I don't know that, that we have an official position on that, but each of us could answer that individually, um, and I'm happy to, to talk with you afterwards on, on reasons um, why, but that's certainly one that I have some family experience um, with. Your second question related to um, researching outside of a university, absolutely yes, and we are looking for university partners um, who, who, are, who would love for us to come and to do this research in your university. Um, because we understand that our university is different and it does not reflect the same state of things in other universities in Kazakhstan. There is a dearth of research in Kazakhstan on these issues and I believe our, our role at Nazarbayev University is to do some of that research, is to take on some of these um, topics that perhaps other scholars can't. Um, and that we can provide support for others who are interested um, in these topics in other universities. So yes, we would love to come to your university um, and to work with you on doing some, some research um, on these topics. I would also encourage you to reach out to our School of Medicine um, because we have some, some faculty in our School of Medicine who are doing just this and looking at these topics um, specifically related to the medical field in Kazakhstan and medical um, education. Uh, if, if you're interested in coming to the Gender Forum next week, we will have some sessions and some workshops on gender and medical education specifically um, that we would be happy for you to come to. And the last question was... Oh, you know, I, I honestly, I, I can say that I don't have enough um, knowledge of this area to be able to 
broadly, then we can say, as you're saying, that so the, gender, the concern of gender scholars doesn't have a particular stance on with the yeah. issue of the army, the same thing. In general, we don't have a particular stance other than this one where we're talking about gender equality in general, right? Non-discrimination in general. Instead, we exist to bring out the research on topics, all different types of topics around gender and having then a, for, a format for people to come together, whether through in, informal mentorship and maybe in the future then formal mentorship, which would be great. And then next week, if you all are around, we would love for you to come back on Thursday and Friday. We have the first, as Loretta was saying, gender forum, which will take place. We have presentations from the medical school. We have, as Rianne talked, she will be talking as well about gender in the curriculum in her program. And we will, many of us will be speaking, including Loretta. And so we actually have come to the end of our time, but if anyone would like to stay and talk or exchange numbers or anything, please, please do come up, stay back, reach out to us. Thank you all very much for being here and to your co-presenters. Just a suggestion from our organizers is that when you're ready, if you'd like to make your way down to the Orange Hall, uh, where we were this morning, there will be a presentation from the McKinsey representative, his name is Nate, but who has apparently arrived. So we'll hear from him about um, uh, work and the changing world of work according to 